If a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? I've always said yes, but recently I've been changing my answers. What this question is really asking is if the tree's existence is dependent on being perceived, does something become less real or not real at all if no one is watching? I'd like to say no, but there is something deep inside me that screams otherwise. You see, when I put myself in the analogy, when I become the tree, suddenly everything is clear. As a writer, as an artist, what am I doing if not begging to be seen, shouting into a void to prove that I am here, I am real, I exist? Where does this desperation come from if not from a deep understanding that some part of existence is dependent on perception? Where does this desire come from if not from an inherent fear that I am a tree in the forest falling with no one around to hear? Just being out in nature is such an amazing thing. Breathe in the fresh air. Hope you're getting some peace. Three days off, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Spend these three days in the mountains. Snowboarding four or five hours a day. And that is my complete exercise for the day. And, uh, yeah, it's just gorgeous. Got some light snow up in the mountains. Should be a good day. So, one of the things I wanted to talk about is, you know, back in 1976, I moved to Los Angeles. And as I said before, I used to stop here in Colorado and uh, see my friends up in Georgetown. Uh, but, you know, I lived in Los Angeles. I went to Los Angeles City College. That's where I started out at. But there came a point where uh, I wanted to advance my studies and go on to USC. But 1979, my brother had moved from Houston, uh, Beaumont, over to uh, Delray Beach, Florida, and contacted me and said, how you doing? And I said, not so good. Things were a little bit rocky at the time. You know, my brother was kind enough to fly me down to Florida, said he had a windsurfer business, but as it turns out, what he really was doing was uh, smuggling marijuana uh, on boats uh, from the Bahamian Islands uh, into Port Everglades, Florida. So uh, I went down there and uh, upon arrival, I learned what he was doing. He took me over to his 42 foot post um, sport fisher boat and uh, introduced me to Linnea, Linnea, our boat, uh, which was basically uh, our vessel to go out and retrieve um, marijuana uh, in the Bahamian Islands. Uh, during this period of time, I. Uh, you know, got fully engaged in fitness and started working out with my brother. My brother would look like Frank Zane, uh, the famous bodybuilder, and was just ripped and tan. And so that's what I want to do is pursue fitness. So I started going to the gym with him and going through these double workouts and things and uh, really caught the bug for fitness. And it was at that point I'd always been, uh, you know, really athletic. But um, now I was really into bodybuilding and powerlifting. And, uh, you know, it was a great time for, for me. And then we, you know, got involved with uh, smuggling marijuana. We used to go out with the 42-foot post over in Bimini in the behind Bahamian Islands and basically meet the bigger ships. And we'd load our boat with 5,000 pounds of marijuana and then bring it into the Port Everglades and Fort, La Fort Lauderdale. So it was a um, pretty scary time, uh, you know, running these loads out in the Bahamian waters at nighttime where pirates lurked everywhere. Um, you were always equipped with M16s to basically, if you saw on the radar, an unidentified boat coming, you just took us and you sprayed the M16 around your boat to, to basically scare them off. 
but it was a very um, very exciting time um, I've always been a fan uh, of the legalization of cannabis and never thought it should be illegal in any way so um, you know, I had nothing against it. I, I saw nothing wrong with sm smuggling marijuana. And, uh, you know, we made a few trips out there. Um, and then in 1980, um, we were nabbed by the DEA and CPOs, Customs and Patrol officers, coming into the Port Everglades with 5,000 pounds. Subsequently, I uh, went through a trial period of three years, which time I went back to USC and used some of my money to go to USC. But during that time, we had an appeal and everything. And uh, the judge at that time in 1980, if you remember, Reagan had come into power and Bush was running the task force down in Florida. And uh, he was uh, using AWAC planes uh, to basically s survey the Bahamian Islands and find the boats that were loading up and then follow them into Port Everglades. And then they'd pull us over for you know, they board our vessels uh, based upon riding low in the water, which was the catchphrase for all DEA and CPOs at the time. They knew they could get away with it uh, they, because once they opened the doors and found the pot, um, it was pretty clear that we were carrying 5,000 pounds. So that argument usually uh, held up in court. But the truth of the matter was engineers did a study for us with our lawyers and showed that because we had removed all the furniture in the main stateroom and all uh, accessory uh, weight, uh, there was no difference in the level of where the boat was riding in the water. But um, again, because of Reagan and the say no to drugs, you know, marijuana was still viewed as a drug, which, you know, is something I've fought all my life. It's a, it's a plant and it's very medicinal and very good for you. Anyone who thinks differently has probably not tried it before. And anyway, um, so we were sentenced. Um, Judge Rutker uh, sentenced us to nine years because I had had past um, possession of marijuana uh, up in Hamburg, New York, and things like that. So anyway, I got nine years. Um, and, you know, during this process, we appealed it again. Um, and then right when I was graduating from USC, in 1983, um, I had to report nine months later to La Tuna. Uh, during that time at USC, in my junior year, I was part of a, a documentary crew that USC's School of Broadcast Journalism, uh, with a great uh, little director producer, Sherry Cookson, who basically um, came up with an idea of doing a study and a documentary on the Crips and the Bloods in Los Angeles in the unusual initiation rite they had of shooting someone in cold blood in front of other gang members as the way to get into the um, the gang so it was uh, quite a quite a thing that was going on in Los Angeles at the time um, we did this documentary we ended up winning the National Emmy for the best student documentary in the United States and uh, got to go and receive our Emmy and 1982 from Loretta Swit uh, from for some of you old school people uh, from MASH she was hot lips uh, anyway she gave us our Emmy and that was the uh, first Emmy I won in 1982 along with the rest of the team uh, but that didn't make any difference to the judge he was intent upon you know handing out very disciplinary and very severe sentences so I got uh, nine years of which is required at a minimum you spend three years in a federal correction penitentiary and uh, so they shipped me down to La Tuna which is um, Spanish for the cactus and rightfully it is a name that um, fits this place it's right on the Juarez El Paso border and uh, it had 850 Mexicans and 43 white guys um, and I was shipped down there by mistake. Um, they said they made a mistake, but the BOP, the Bureau of Prisons, is never quick uh, to correct their mistakes. And so I went to my counselor and they said, I'm in the wrong place, I'm in a level four or five. I'm supposed to be in a camp. I, it's a nonviolent crime I committed. And uh, he said, well, yeah, we made a mistake, but uh, we'll get it right. And it took seven months to get a transfer uh, out to the camp. But during that time in uh, Latuna, 
you know, I've met a lot of unsavory characters and some pretty cool cats too. Um, it was a uh, time of a lot of smuggling, so a lot of the guys I was in prison for were smuggling marijuana. It was no big deal. I remember I was doing time with uh, Tommy Head from the Minnesota Vikings and another player from uh, the New England Patriots, um, and they were basically uh, caught when they're playing malfunctioned coming across from Mexico to Texas and basically um, you know uh, went down and were caught with uh, 10,000 pounds of marijuana so Tommy Head was about 6'5 and 280 and uh, they took me underneath their wing when I first got into prison they came over and saw me benching and squatting and said who's this little white boy you know squat 550 pounds and uh, they kind of took me under their wing and uh you know, it was a it was a very very difficult time for me. I never really thought I'd make it through prison. In fact, on the first day, they put you in a holding cell before you're put into population. And I thought, you know, I'm just not going to make this. I'd rather die. And I contemplated suicide at that time. Um, I ended up, you know, learning a, a very valuable lesson that you know, when you're in a situation like that, you have two choices. You know, you got to be accountable or unaccountable. And I was accountable for what I did. And, you know, the law says marijuana is illegal at that time. <laughs> um, and the irony of this whole story is that my grandfather uh, ran a restaurant that was in his family for 74 years in Buffalo, New York. A very famous restaurant down in downtown Buffalo. And during the Prohibition era of 1920 to 1933, the Volstead Act, um, he used to go over to Canada basically uh, import booze from Canada and was arrested coming in a boat from Canada and was put in jail. So, you know, here we are two generations later and I'm in prison for marijuana and now today we find ourselves in 2024 with it being legalized everywhere. Um, something I've argued for my entire life. Um, there is nothing, it is not the gateway drug that morons labeled it. And it is a completely medicinal uh, plant that was put here by God so that we could enjoy the euphoria and the uh, uplifting benefits of CBG. CBGs are all really good for you and, uh, you know, they, they help with your relaxation, anxiety, depression, sleep. You know, I take CBN at nighttime and it helps me sleep soundly for seven hours. So um, I'm a big believer in the, you know, benefits of uh, cannabidiols. Um, um, I'm finally being proven right, but that doesn't take away the fact that I served three years in a federal pen penitentiary for marijuana, which, you know, um, you look back and you go, yeah, kind of a wasted three years because the reality is, is that unless you assert yourself and apply yourself in prison, you'll never do anything. So I decided to insert myself during prison and start reading and writing. And it's when I first began my book called Tariff, which is kind of a play on words, a euphemism for uh, what's going on or what has happened in society. We, you know, at times in our society, we impose duties and penalties on things like booze back in the 1920s and say it's totally wrong, you can go to prison for it. And the same holds true of the 60s and 70s when we labeled marijuana drugs and, you know, put people in prison for it. Uh, people should have never gone to prison, nor should they today, for marijuana. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, these are my strong opinions. I really don't care, um, you know, what society says. I know from firsthand experience, I've been using, you know, cannabis for 50 years. Uh, it's never done me wrong. Alcohol was the ruin of my life. Um, alcohol was something I didn't even know I was addicted to for 50 years. I just liked to have my one or two glasses of wine a night. But the reality is that when you have a urge like that and a dependency, you are an addict. And my personality is I have an addictive personality. It's a great song from uh, Bumpin' Ugly's um, Addictive Personality. And it really, you know, encapsulates exactly what the addictive personality is about. And after reading Matthew Perry's book, Friends, Lovers, and the Big Horrible Thing, you know, I 
began to realize in 2022 when I read, read this book that I too had a disease and that disease was no matter what you put me around whether it was cocaine heroin speed it, did, it didn't matter I have an addictive personality when I start doing something I do too much of it and so you know in, in recognizing this disease that I had through reading Matthew Perry's book um, I quit drinking about a year and a half ago and I can honestly say that if you're looking for a real breakthrough in your life stop drinking it is the number one source of irritation uh, hangovers not feeling good irritable irritableness it, all of the bad things in my life everything that I had a chance to do in my life was ruined by my addictive personality and you know if you have an addictive personality and you're having a problem uh, breaking it I would encourage you strongly to seek help um, or just quit outright drinking um, lesson learned the downside to sobriety is it brings the curse of clarity and that curse is something that really you know it 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 touches you emotionally mentally physically and you begin to realize you know how badly sometimes you uh, were to people in life and what you did in life and uh, now that I'm free of that addiction of alcohol um, I'm finding that this clarity that I'm having is a little scary, um, a little tough to look back on. You know, um, I have some regrets. Um, I wish I would have quit sooner. But back to the saying I said in episode one: nobody can go back and start a new beginning. Anybody can <laughs> begin today and start a new ending. You can always change the ending in your life. And that starts with today. So what I would encourage you, if you're struggling with things um, and you have an addiction, don't, don't count yourself out. Don't put yourself down. Don't just say, well, that's who I am and I like to drink um, or I like to do cocaine or I like, to, you know, just stop doing it um, and realize the freedom that it brings you in life because it will bring you freedom. Uh, to begin to think, to begin to read, to begin to write, to begin to do everything in your life that you've ever aspired to want to do, you can now do because each and every day is a brand new day. There is no hangover. You don't feel bad. And you start each morning with a fresh approach and then you, you begin, you know, seizing the day um, and really embracing the day and getting the most out of it. So the amount of information that's at our fingertips now is astounding and I would encourage everyone to just tap into it and utilize those resources because they're valuable. Uh, they educate you, you bring about a greater awareness of what you want to do with your life, what's possible in life. So, you know, each and every day you'll have the opportunity without drugs and alcohol to basically wake up and begin a new day. Um, and have a fresh start and have, have a realization that you can make a new ending in your life. So I just want to be an encouragement to a lot of people that, you know, have gone through the similar things, which I'm sure there's other people like me. Um, I'm not the anomaly in society. Many people struggle with addiction and recognize that you have an addictive personality and a disease is first and foremost in changing. Once you realize that and you don't want it anymore, there is no problem quitting drinking. I never have had a day where I look back and said, oh, I'd love to get a bottle of wine or, you know, I just don't anymore because I realize how much better my life is. When you realize how good life is and each and every day is so full, you never have to sleep in because you have a hangover, you never feel bad, you never, you know, f bypass a workout, a gym, going snowboarding, you oh, I don't feel good today. You are on point every day so just want to be encouragement um, I was 65 before this happened to me yeah 50 years of an addictive personality a disease I was not even aware of you know and uh, now I'm aware of it I have this clarity and uh, I'm making a new ending in my life so make a new ending in your life too. start today today's the first day of your life there, there are no past there is no future. Today is the only day you have. Go out and seize it, squeeze it, embrace it, love it, and live it. I'm trying to figure out the rocks, how to climb them.
Beginning of a snowshoe hike out to Gladstone Mine with my daughter and Christian. Beautiful day. I was thinking I should have done that, but... Yeah, I think it's... Uh, I think I have it lighter. I think it's okay. Yeah. Ready to roll back down the hill. Snowing pretty good.